Dear friends, the decisive existential event in the life of Friedrich von Hardenberg was the death of Sophie von Kuhn in March 1797. Before this event, we find a personality known as Friedrich von Hardenberg, 1772-1801. After Sophie's death, Hardenberg named himself Novalis. For the three years after Sophie's death, from 1798 to 1801, Novalis is tirelessly active as a poet, philosopher, mining engineer, civil servant, and in many other ways. He becomes the leading spirit of early Romanticism, that brief period of literary splendor in Central Europe at the end of the 18th century. This 18th century Saxon aristocrat Friedrich von Hardenberg gave himself the pen name Novalis when he claimed his identity as a poet. The name has a history in the Hardenberg family, by the way. Hardenberg did not invent it, nor did he receive it in signature of a revelation. We know this from the family history and from reading Hardenberg's diaries and letters. As he himself described it to his friend Friedrich Schlegel, the use of the name Novalis was quite evident and natural. It was a name, quote, not entirely inappropriate for publication. A key term for Novalis is magical idealism. It is a term Novalis used to describe his poetic approach to life, and it is key to understanding his activity in the world. While much can be said about how Novalis derived his idea of magical idealism from close study of German philosophy, especially Fichte's philosophy and Fichte's revisions of Kant's philosophy, we can perhaps better understand intuitively what Novalis meant by magical idealism by observing how Hardenberg became Novalis. The transformation of the administrative law clerk, Fritz von Hardenberg, into the poet Novalis is, as many have argued, the first and foremost demonstration of magical idealism. It is a magical idealist deed. And while it is certainly helpful to unpack the concept of magical idealism from within the context of German 18th century philosophy, Readers who possess an artistic sensitivity for the open secret of Hardenberg's biography, they may find their way more intuitively to a poetic understanding. <laughs> now, many critical readers have remarked disparagingly that Hardenberg's biography reminds us of a fairy tale. Uh, those readers use the word fairy tale pejoratively as if to imply that here we are dealing with something simple and naively sentimental, a fable suitable for gullible children, but not adequate fare for sober-minded adults. But Novalis, who regarded fairy tales as a high form of poetry and literature, <laughs> would have taken this rebuke as a compliment it is clear from the numerous fragments and the writings that Novalis left behind that he believed that a human biography should, should indeed resemble a fairy tale. <laughs> and if such a statement sounds strange, perhaps Novalis would say that this strangeness only shows how far we have fallen from a magical idealist understanding of human life. How timidly we have failed to grasp that the world must be romanticized. 
Now, here's a quote that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's probably one of the fragments that inspired me to begin my study of Novalis and early Romanticism 50 years ago. The world must be romanticized. In this way, one will discover the original meaning once again. Romanticizing is nothing but a qualitative increase to a higher power. By means of this operation, the lower self becomes one with a better self. We ourselves are a product of just such a series of qualitative increases. This operation is yet entirely unknown. I romanticize the world to the extent that I give the commonplace a higher meaning, the ordinary a mystery-laden aspect, the known the dignity of the unknown, the finite the luster of infinity. The operation for the higher, the unknown, the mystical, and the eternal is just the opposite. By means of this connection, these undergo a logarithmic change. They assume an everyday aspect. Romantic philosophy, lingua romana, alternation of ascension and descent. The journey toward magical idealism, or toward the romanticization of the world, took a decisive turn for Novalis during his years with Sophie. These critical years of courtship and engagement were years in which Hardenberg, who had not yet named himself Novalis, was intensely engaged in philosophy, especially the philosophies of Fichte and Kant. One could say that during these years of courtship and engagement, two worlds coexisted. The emotional world of love, Sophie, and the intellectual world of philosophy, Fichte. The magical idealist task that Sophie's fiancé set himself was, how can these separate worlds be brought together? In the last months of 1797, Friedrich von Hardenberg jotted down three questions in his notebook, and I'll read these to you as you look at them. Concept of sense. According to Kant, pure mathematics and pure natural science refer to the forms of our outer directed senses. What science then refers to the forms of our inner directed senses? Is there supersensible knowledge? Is there perhaps another way open to go out of oneself and to reach other beings or be affected by them? Hardenberg posed these questions during a time of crisis. Sophie, whom Hardenberg had met in November 1794 and to whom he became engaged in 1795, had died on March 19, 1797. Hardenberg's beloved brother Erasmus died shortly after Sophie on Good Friday, April 14, 1797, and the distraught Friedrich could not bear to attend Sophie's funeral, neither her service nor her burial. He visited Sophie's grave for the first time on April 16th, in his grief, his thoughts hovered between life and death, and he spoke and wrote of his desire to follow Sophie by dying after. Now, dying after certainly sounds romantic. The word in German is nachsterben. And certainly the crisis here was profound, but readers who see Novalis in the role of Romeo have placed too much emphasis on death and suicide, it would appear. The Germanist Helmut Rader, for example, noted how letters and journals written by Hardenberg during this period of crisis, quote, reflect the deliberate technique and indeed even the language of pietistic practice, which aims at complete control over emotions, thoughts, and will, unquote. 
In fact, when, when you read the journal, as I do recommend that you do, uh, one is struck by the remarkable tone of calm and a decided underplay of emotionality in many of the entries. Uh, readers of English can avail themselves of my translation of the complete journal, if that is helpful. Significantly, three works occupied the poet's attention during this period. Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship, and Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, and Shakespeare's Hamlet, two plays by Shakespeare recently translated by Hardenberg's friend August Schlegel. Novalis received a freshly translated copy of Romeo and Juliet on the morning of the day that he had his famous experience at Sophie's grave. His friend Friedrich Schlegel sent him the play, and the play and Shakespeare made an immediate and profound impression on Novalis, as we can read in a letter that he sent to Schlegel. It is remarkable that you sent me Romeo just now. I've read it often. There is a profound meaning in what you say, that here we find more than mere poetry. And yet, as I noted earlier, it would be a mistake to think that Hardenberg saw himself in the role of Romeo, or perhaps he did but changed his mind. For example, we have this quote from the introduction to volume four of the collected works. Uh, the change that gradually crystallizes from this process in the journal leads from despair and utter exhaustion to a renewed affirmation of life. The means to this transformation is a self-criticism that admonishes him, Novalis, toward the goal of presence of mind, moderation, and calm, albeit true that backslidings from this goal do occur. Shakespeare, Wilhelm Meister, and Hamlet were decisive for Novalis during the time of grief and mourning after Sophie's death, and one might speak in a literary sense of an important spiritual acquaintance or relationship between Hardenberg and Shakespeare at this time. Here's a quote. Now I begin to intuit what makes Shakespeare so unique. It may awaken in me divinatory powers. Here is the entire entry for May 13th, 1797, the day on which the experience at Sophie's grave occurred. We find in this passage the famous words quoted by Rudolf Steiner and many others in reference to the significance of this event, although Rudolf Steiner made no mention of Shakespeare to my knowledge. This mysterious friendship between Shakespeare and Novalis is a topic that I explored in a little essay for Das Goetheanum that appeared in May 2001, quite a while ago, the 200th anniversary year of the death of Novalis. It's an essay in which I unpack the spiritual significance of Goethe's novel Wilhelm Meister, Shakespeare's play Hamlet, the character Hamlet, and Shakespeare himself at this critical time in the transformation of Hardenberg to Novalis. I updated this essay for the 250th anniversary year of the birth of Novalis, and you can find it on the section website. Friedrich Hebel, who wrote a very helpful book on Novalis, pointed out that three events shape Hardenberg's self-observed work of mourning, and landmark the stages of his inner development and his renaming as Novalis. The first event is the famous experience on May 13th at Sophie's grave, the one we just talked about, when Hardenberg has an ecstatic vision of the conflation of time and eternity. Rudolf Steiner compared this experience to St. Paul's experience before the gates of Damascus. The second event occurred on May 29th when Hardenberg, traveling by horseback to Sophie's parents' family home, noted in a rather matter-of-fact language that he had the joy of finding the true concept of the Fichtian eye. 
And finally, the third milestone in this magical idealist process of inner development occurred as a one-line entry in his journal of June 29th, and it reads simply, Christ and Sophie. And then the journal abruptly ends. It does not end with a romantic suicide on the tomb. <laughs> no, in fact, life went on. Hardenberg enrolled in a prestigious mining academy, you might say the MIT of its day. And shortly after that, he became engaged to another woman, unlike Sophie, a mature woman closer to his age. And he named himself Novalis. I just want to pause for a moment to return to a brief consideration of the event on May 29th, and then I'll conclude this second lecture of the five-part series. This entry in Hardenberg's journal is often unknown to readers or overlooked. Many readers focus on the more famous and celebrated experience at Sophie's grave on May 13th. <laughs> like, like most open secrets, it is easy to overlook the significance of this brief diary entry on May 29th, especially if one is unfamiliar with Fichte's philosophy, or if one has never wrestled with Fichte or Schelling or Kant or others in that tribe, or if one is unaware of the extreme spiritual dramatic impact that Fichte had on young men such as Hardenberg. As I have said, during the time of engagement and during the time of mourning, Hardenberg meditated German idealist philosophy intensively. To draw a parallel with the 21st century and with the Asian spiritual traditions that many of us are more familiar with these days, we might say that Hardenberg sat with Fichte's philosophy as one sits with a Zen Buddhist koan. To extend that analogy, if it works for you, <laughs> one sits with a koan meditatively to break through to a non-dualistic spiritual insight into the nature of one's true human beingness. Who am I? What is I? When a breakthrough happens, if it happens, one overcomes momentarily the limitations of sense-bound thinking one achieves insight. Now, in this lecture series, I have called this experience of insight magical idealist insight, since I'm speaking in the context of Novalis, his life and works. You might instead call this moment of insight a moment of mystical union, or a moment of enlightenment, so-called. <laughs> enlightenment about what? Well, once again, the true nature of the I. Who am I? What is I? Here's a quote by Novalis from his first publication, Pollen, that expresses the same idea obliquely and poetically. This quote, by the way, is another key to magical idealism. It's similar to the other quote that we looked at, the world must be romanticized. Either fragment could be meditated. This same moment of insight, by the way, I should mention this, occurred for the young Rudolf Steiner. We know this because Rudolf Steiner wrote about his experience in a letter. At the time when he was 20, Steiner tells us, he was meditating very intensely the same philosophical koans that young Hardenberg grappled with. Steiner mentions specifically the philosophy of Schelling. Schelling was a contemporary of Novalis. Schelling and Novalis were friends. They visited the famous Madonna together in Dresden. I will talk about their friendship and the visit to the Madonna in future lectures if I find the time or if there's interest. As it turns out, Hardenberg and Steiner were reading Schelling when their breakthroughs to insight occurred. Hardenberg mentioned Fichte, and as you certainly know, Fichte was equally important to Rudolf Steiner, extremely important 
as we know from Steiner himself. Young Steiner and young Hardenberg each grappled with the i koans, as I'm calling them, that we find in the philosophies of Fichte and Schelling. And each of them had a breakthrough, and each one made a lapidary note of the event. And here are the words written by Rudolf Steiner describing the event. Schelling says, Innate in all of us is a secret, wonderful capacity to withdraw from the changing fortunes of time into our inmost self, unrobed of all that is attached to us from without, and there, in an immutable form, to behold eternal in us. I believed, and still now believe, that I have discovered that inmost capacity very clearly within me, having long had an intimation of it. The whole of idealistic philosophy now stands before me in a substantially modified form. <laughs> what is a sleepless night compared to such a discovery? So, to finish up and move this discussion back into literary context, one might argue that this process of spiritual awakening and inner transformation described by Novalis in his journal reminds one of Goethe's well-known poem from the West Eastern Divan, Divan means a collection of poems, a poem titled The Holy Longing. The poem begins like this in Robert Bly's translation. Tell a wise person or keep silent because the mass man will mock it right away. I praise what is truly alive, what longs to be burned to death. Now, I should also point out that Rudolf Steiner used Goethe's poem as an example of enlightenment, or unio mystica, in his 1923 introduction to the book Eleven European Mystics. Rudolf Steiner's words are very helpful here in respect to the experience of Friedrich von Hardenberg during his time of mourning for Sophie, that time of magical idealist alchemy when he became the poet Novalis. Thank you for your attention and for your interest in the section for the literary arts and humanities and for your interest in Novalis and Romanticism. Good night.